on me right now. I'm over it. <laughs> Ready for some sunshine. Mm, my, my, my. Uh, we're in number three of this new series called Signs. The Gospel of John is unique, different from the other synoptic gospels that are more historical, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the Gospel of John chooses uh, just... It's not arbitrarily, it was very intentional, chose seven sign miracles, samion is the Greek word, because they are signposts, they're pointing to something greater than just the actual occurrence, a supernatural, miraculous event. Um, I, I used the illustration a couple of weeks ago when we first started, and that is that you don't pull over at the billboard that says Cracker Barrel and wait for a waitress to come to the car to, to, you know, get your order because it's not under the sign, but the sign is pointing you to where the source is. So when we see signs and wonders demonstrated in the lives of people, it's to point to one who is greater. His name is Jesus, okay? Uh, I, I believe that if, if, our, if our object is seeking healing, then we miss. We miss something. But if we seek the healer, then we've got the healing. Come on, somebody. If you're, if you're seeking provision and you need financial breakthrough, uh, I think we miss out on something. But if we seek the one who is the provider, Yahweh Yuri, Jehovah Jireh, we say in English, the Lord who sees and provides. The title of the message this morning is called The Lame Man at the Pool of Bethesda. You've all heard this. Uh, the text is John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. I want to take time. It's a little extensive, normally more than we do, but I want to take time to read this just to really get the text and the context. It says in verse 1 of John 5, After this... There was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate. Everybody say the sheep gate. What do you figure happens at the sheep gate? The sheep come in and go out, okay? That's, I believe, relevant to us as sheep, and he is our shepherd. So, in the provision of where the sheep come in, there is also called in Hebrew Bethesda, having, it's a pool, having five porches. Everybody say grace. Five is the number of grace. When all of the brothers came before Joseph in Egypt and Joseph had met his true full-blooded brother, same daddy, same mama. His name was Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. Joseph gave every one of his brothers a portion, but to Benjamin he gave five portions, full brothers. How many of you know that because we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, we've been given five portions. It's called grace. Come on, somebody. God pours out. There is, in the scripture in Ephesians chapter um, 4, it talks about the five-fold ministry. To some he gave to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That is God's grace gifts that have been divided and given into, deposited into humankind for the propagation of the gospel, for the advancement of the kingdom, for the maturing of the saints to do the work of the ministry. So that's, again, a demonstration of the grace of God. Five all over Scripture is always the number of grace. So there are five porches at Bethesda. Verse 3, in these lay a great number of sick people. Everybody say sick people. Sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, everybody say first, after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man, everybody say a certain man. A certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Everybody say, long time. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, 
and walk. Say those words with me. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Notice there are three statements in one sentence. Rise, three things. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. So three things that we want to mark in our understanding. And immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. So you see... The three words that Jesus spoke in commandments had the authority to produce those three actions in the man with an infirmity for 38 years in his life. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. The, The strict observance of the law regarding the Sabbath was there was to be no work. Was, you, you couldn't make a fire, you couldn't bake bread. Everything that you did on the Sabbath had to have been prepared the day before. And religion, especially dead, powerless, presenceless religion that is only concerned with dotting I's and crossing T's and making what they see as an angry God happy, then takes this and puts this on the man. They ought to have been shouting with him because he'd gotten well. But instead of rejoicing that a man who's no longer laid out there, laid up on the government, in other words, he's no longer laid out there depending on somebody else to take care of him, instead of being able to rejoice that somebody who's been in a bad way for most of their life is now healed, they're more concerned that he's toting his bed on on a Saturday. And and this is the, the constant tension and contradiction between the Pharisees and Jesus on a regular basis. And Jesus looked at them on more times than not because they would always get upset with him with what he was doing on the Lord's Day. How many of you know it's the Lord's Day? The Lord ought to be able to do what he wants to do. Look at your neighbor and say, God can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. Jesus looked at them one day and he said, guys, you don't get it because you think that man was made for the Sabbath. Actually, it's the other way around. The Sabbath was made for man. And he was demonstrating that he is and was, before their presence, the Son of Man, the Son of God, who had authority in the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they ask him, who is this man, or who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Verse 15, and I'm finished with the text. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his eternal, inspired, authoritative word and all of God's people said. One thing, this is the little tool that I use so that if you don't get anything else, you get this because we're going to repeat this. It's like a a hymn that we sing with a verse and then a chorus. And then we sing the second verse and we go back and do the chorus again. We repeat it. Then we sing the third verse and go back and do the chorus again. We sing the fourth verse, go back and do the chorus again. So this is like the chorus in the sermon. This one thing I want you to grab with me this morning. And as you find a screen, left or right, either one, read with me. Jesus calls me, everybody say, to let go of who I was then and who I am now to become who he is making me. Don't get confused by that. It actually is very common sense if you'll think about it. Come on, read it with me like you mean it. Jesus calls me to let go of who I was then and who I am now to become who he is making me. Everybody together, read it with 100%. Give it to me right now. Jesus calls me to let go of who I was then and who I am now to become who he is making me. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we take those words to heart this morning. Thank you that there are things from our past that we must lay down and let go. We must identify with new life. We must let death come to the old way of thinking, to our old life. 
even the apostle wrote and said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God, thank you for newness. Thank you, Lord, for victory. Thank you, Lord, for deliverance. We're careful to give you the praise, and we ask you today that, Holy Spirit, you would do what only you can do in this message. I specifically ask you right now. I acknowledge that I need you. I'm desperate for you. I know apart from you I can do nothing, but I thank you that I'm no longer apart from you that I'm joined to Christ and we are one and through him I can do all things. Those things which he's called me to do, I thank you for that. And I give you praise. I ask you specifically for clarity. Let this be clear in the understanding of your people and I ask for brevity. Let me say what what needs to be said and Lord, it not take all day. And all the congregation said amen. And we ask this in Jesus' name and do it again. And the congregation said, all right. Jesus calls me to let go of who I was then and who I am now to become who he is making me. And that one thing might just be throwing you a little. How are you going to tie that to this sick man in the pool of Bethesda? Well, just hang on for a few minutes and here we go. Point number one, lying by the pool. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I hear the phrase lying by the pool, this is not the image that I get. I'm looking at chlorine clear blue water, and I'm, I'm, I can smell suntan lotion, I, something cooking on the grill, and, and the sun is bright, and it's hot, and I'm jumping in the pool, and I'm getting some refreshing, getting a little bit of color in my skin. And, and, and when I think of lying by the pool, it's a recreational thing. It's not a hospital situation. And literally what this was, when you look back, and I'm not going to take time to reread it, but in verses 1 through 4 of John 5, you see the context of what's happening here. In Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, and this is definitely concerned with the people of God, because Jesus likens us to sheep more than any other animal in all of the creation. And he says, my sheep know me, they hear my voice, and they follow not the voice of a stranger. And so there is an entrance point, and I believe that entrance point is at the sheep gate is the gospel. That's the only way you can get in. Jesus said, any man who comes any other way is a thief and a robber. He says, because I am the door, John 10, and he that comes to me, he must come because the Father has drawn him. Somebody say Amen. So the sheep gate is the the gospel. It's hearing the message. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And when we do that and when we release our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, then we're identified as his sheep. He calls us each by name. Somebody say amen. In this place is a pool called Bethesda. You think of uh, there, you think of Bethesda, Maryland. You think of the, the location where there is a great hospital. And so many times in all over the United States of America and in other places, especially in Europe, where the gospel has had a lasting influence, there you will see it in the names of the cities all over Arkansas. I mean, you go down the road, there's Jericho. Up the road is Palestine instead of Palestine. And, and, and all over the place, you will see names that are found in Scripture. And especially when it comes to hospitals, it is always associated with some of these locations in Scripture where people were healed. Bethesda literally means in the Hebrew, house of mercy. Also, house of grace. Both of those are correct translations. But it's interesting, Hebrew is a very complex language, and so is English. And I'm going to give you an illustration of what I'm saying in just a moment. But depending on how this was used in the context, it could either mean house of mercy or it could take on the negative side, the flip of the coin, and it could mean shame. It could mean house of grace or you could flip the coin. Perhaps it was the tone in which someone spoke the word. And instead of meaning house of grace, it would mean disgrace. And how many of you know when there's something wrong and you're having to be in a place where a bunch of sick and paralyzed and lame and all kinds of afflictions and you've had an infirmity all of your life, there can encroach upon you a sense of shame because you're not whole. 
you're not well. And in and, 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 and the place where grace is administered, sometimes folk can look down their nose at you and end up putting disgrace on you instead of the grace of God. Come on, somebody. I, I want you to hear me this morning. Because unfortunately in the Bible Belt South, there is the spirit of Pharisaism that is still fully alive and well. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good already. But I want you to hear this morning that we need to have the spirit of Jesus and not the spirit of the Pharisees. Come on, somebody. Well, what's the point of this language? Well, you know, we do it in English as well. Just everybody say the word right. Now, not to write with a pen, W-R-I-T-E, but write, R-I-G-H-T. Say right. It is my right to choose my life goals. That word right means freedom. You are exactly right, which means you're correct. Go to the light and turn right, which means direction. That's the opposite of left. Correct, right, is the opposite of wrong. And the whole point is, it is my right to choose to turn right, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be the right way to go. I just used the exact same word. It had three different meanings. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So depending on your tone of voice, and sometimes it's just how you say things that people, oh, you are so smart. Well, you're just so smart. (laughs) Two totally different meanings. Do you hear me? And so this place of Bethesda, which should be a house of mercy, is also a place where there is great shame because there's so many people that are broken, so many people that are hurt. And what I want to tell you is, is that Jesus loves every one of us in the middle of our brokenness and our shame and our disgrace. And he loved us enough that he stretched out his hands and died for us and paid the price. I love it. This place is a place of hope. Because they're laid around. I've actually been to the location. I've seen it. It's, it's a, a graduation of steps descending down into a pool. And, 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 and they, they would walk down the steps and get into the pool and bathe. And it had been said that there was a season where an angel had come and uh, an appearance of a messenger of God and had stirred the water. And the first one who got into the pool got out of the pool with the disease they had gone. Everybody say, well... Come on, put your hands together and give him praise. So the location had become a place of hope. And all manner of sick people, paralyzed and lame and blind and deaf and every kind of physical malady was represented laying around all of these five porches and up at the top of the steps descending into the pool. Remember, Jesus calls me to let go of who I was then and who I am now. Everybody say now. To become who he is making me. Point number two. Verses five through nine, we read that there was a certain lame man. Notice that when Jesus deals with your life, he doesn't just throw a generalization over the top of you, but he knows the specifics. The Spirit of God, the Spirit knows where you live. He knows the balance in your checking account. He knows what your 401k has in it. He knows the situation of your marriage. He knows how your, your rotten kids are acting. He knows, he knows how you've been behaving. He knows, whether, he knows whether faith has been in your mouth or whether doubt and unbelief has been coming out. And how many of you know, in spite of all that he knows, he still says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know. There was a certain man. There are specifics And the scripture says that he had had this infirmity for 38 years. And I do want to go back because it's worthy of looking at this again. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time. Look at that. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in, everybody say, that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? I think that's a strange question, don't you think? Don't you think that anybody who's laid out there waiting for the stirring of the water, 
hoping they can make it down first, getting in the middle of all of that hustle and bustle and the competition to get your toe in the water before before uh, Ezra does next to you or before Nehemiah does next to you or before Lucille just throws herself in. Jesus asks the man a strange question. He says, do you want to be made well? And I've learned scripture for years by reciting, by memorizing, by speaking the scripture. And every time I would say it, I would put the emphasis on a different word. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? I mean, you ask the, the, the lame man, do you want to be made well? And the emphasis is on well. It just almost becomes ludicrous. But back it up and, 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 and just hear this. As we go through that exercise, do you want? Everybody say want. Do you want to be made well? And notice that when Jesus asks him the question, he doesn't say, well, yes, Lord, of course. This is what he says. He says, sir, I have no man. I ain't got nobody. 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 Nobody but me. I ain't got nobody to put me in the pool. I'm laid up here and I can move around a little bit. I can scoot around in this old mat that's shaped like me because I've been laying in it for 38 years. It's got my shape. It's comfortable. It fits me. How many of you know it, it's like an, uh, an old pair of shoes that's shaped to the, the uniqueness uh, and the shape of your foot? When you, when you wear a pair of broken-in shoes, it's just so much better than when you get that first pair of new shoes and you got to wear them on Sunday morning and you just, your feet are just hurting. you got to get those things broken in. This guy has got a bed, and it's, it looks like him. It's shaped like him. It's got his... It's got his mark on it. It's got his set on it. It's, it's where he's been living for 38 years. And Jesus says, do you want to be made well? And the man comes up with just excuses, which I believe is where we are in this room with the area that we're personally struggling in right now. Everybody in the room has got something that hadn't been quite finished yet. Now, anybody want to get a holier-than-thou look? You just go right ahead. Let me tell you what your area is that's unfinished in. It's your self-righteous pride. That's what ain't finished in your life yet. And so, God, forgive us. Help us, Lord, to not get in that kind of a mood or that kind of a mode in terms of how we look at or treat other people that are broken because everybody in the room got something. Come on. Look at your neighbor, and I want you to say it. Don't be proper. Say it this way. Say, everybody. Everybody got something. Jesus asked this man a strange question. He says, do you want to be made well? And and, and I believe that the reason that he asks him that is because it's easy to get into a place that something that we've struggled with so long becomes a part of our identity. And we stop thinking, I have this problem, and we start saying, I am a lame man. We stop saying, I have an infirmity. That's external from my identity, from who I am. And we start living like, I am a drug addict. I am, and you just fill in the blank, what somebody labeled you when you were a kid. You're just stupid, you're no good, you're not going to mount anything, and God Curse that language that was spoken over you as a young child because you are a person of destiny by the power of the Holy Spirit. And whoever it was that said that nonsense to you, God forgive them, release it, let it go. But I'm telling you that's not who you are. In every new life, Every new event, every new breakthrough, there is always a death, a burial, and a resurrection. It's not just the the central historical event of Jesus, the, the Messiah who lived an immaculately perfect sinless life, who came and died a 
a death of paying the penalty and the price for us and was buried and took all the accusation of the law and buried it in the grave and got up without it. Conquering death, victory over death, thank God. It's not just that central event. That is the, literally, those are the bookends. Those three days between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, those are the, those are the critical three days of all of history, especially in Christianity. But every bit of life is marked with a death, a burial, and a resurrection. For every new plant that grows, a seed has died. Maturity in the life of your children means growth. Growth means change. Change means the death of the old and the birth of the new. Now, you know, it's just there's nothing more that demonstrates to us how quickly our time on earth is here than when you have a baby and you turn around in a year and this little bitty tiny helpless thing is talking back to you. And you love them anyway. And, and, and you know, but let me tell you something. There are stages that child goes through, and you're, it's all about, oh, wow, looky here. Uh, the, you're, you're a big boy because you got your big boy pants on. They're not wearing a diaper anymore, and they've, they've learned how to control some things. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. And, and they're wearing their big boy pants. I, 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 was in, I, I was in Fort Worth recently, and I helped Drew to put together a big boy bed for Henry because he'd outgrown his little crib. And, and Grady, who'd been in the bassinet for the first few months in the bedroom with Holly and Drew, was now getting his own room and he was going to get handed down to him Henry's crib. And Henry said, no, that's my crib. <laughs> no, absolutely not. He didn't say it that way, but it was, ah, no, no. I mean, he cried. He got upset. I said, but you're going to get a big boy bed. It's going to be so cool. It has glow-in-the-dark superhero sheets. You've got Batman and Superman and Shazam and all of these cool. And we were talking about big boy, big boy. But, you know, it's, it, it, it's something. You, now, you, you hear his mama talking. She's just kind of grieving the fact that he's not a little baby anymore. Oh, he's, not, he's growing up so fast. And, you know, that's normal. That's normal. But, but when mama, if you've got him in a high chair at 14 and you're still trying to take the spoon into his 14-year-old big boy mouth, kid needs to get a shower and put on some deodorant. He stinks. Get him out of the high chair. How many of you know something's wrong with mama if you're treating him like an infant? Now, I know ain't nobody in this room who does anybody like that, but let me just tell you something. If, if, if you're always treating people out of who they used to be, then you need to grow up. Amen. Folk will keep you locked into the image of who they saw you in high school, or they will keep you locked into the image of a big mistake that you made, a choice that you made, and they'll hang that over your head for the rest of your life. You may, you may have had a baby out of wedlock. Well, guess what? You, you, you're just not all your life going to be identified as an unwed mother. Oh, my gosh. If the church would just wake up and love the mama and love the baby. Come on. We need to teach, we need to teach everybody how to make some good choices. But after the choice has been made, that ain't the time to turn on the shame. It's the time to help somebody when they have some need. Count me this morning. Every bit of new life has a death to it. There's a burial and there's a resurrection. The change that brings the death of the old and the new. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's, I, 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 I want you to see that the, the, the man had a choice and he already had an excuse and he was living as a victim. Everybody say a victim. Isn't it interesting that the same root in victim is the root of victor? It's just which way you're going to shift the perspective. Are you going to be controlled by your circumstances or are you going to get up on top of your circumstances? If they're on top of you, you're a victim. If you're on top of them, you're a victor. Everybody say conqueror. Everybody say overcomer. Oh, I, we love to hear about the overcomer until we realize that means there's something I'm going to have to get over. I'm going to have to come up over. It's an obstacle that I'm going to have to meet. And Jesus gives him three statements. Rise, take up your bed, 
and walk. And this is so powerful to me because in a very holy father-daughter time. Any of you see Abby on Colbert Monday night? Stephen Colbert? Yeah, with Robert Glasper, one of the jazz greats. If you didn't, you can catch it on YouTube. She really, it was a great performance. And the crazy thing was that I picked her up at the airport at 11 about the same time that was airing. It had taped, they had taped it live the week before. And so this, I had her with me this week. I had to get up this morning at 5.30 and got her to the airport because she was flying to California. And at one point this week, we were having a really, really deep heart-to-heart conversation. And I was talking just to her about something that I, I'm struggling with. And, and she looked at me, not knowing that I was doing a series in John, not knowing that this Sunday I was going to be preaching on the lame man. She just looked at me, and, went, and out of her mouth just came clearly and simply Dad, you just need to take up your bed and walk. And she's standing up on the other side of the counter, and I'm sitting down like this, and I'm just like. And I didn't tell her that I was preaching, rise, take up your bed and walk this Sunday. I just, I just stewed it. I meditated it for two days until we were sitting in the garage, pouring down rain outside, just got tired of the house and we're sitting in the garage and we're having probably had a three-hour conversation I said remember the other day when we were talking in the kitchen and, and you said dad you just have to take up your bed and walk I said what what brought that on where where'd that come from she said why I said well because I'm preaching this series and that's the message I'm preaching this Sunday and if you think that didn't slap me in the face when you said that because there's 10,000 illustrations from the scripture that you could have used and Abby knows the word she grew up with it she said every Sunday on the front row listening to her papa preach. <clears throat> and she said, take up your bed and walk. And so we started talking about it and just unpacking it and just had real, true, Holy Ghost fellowship, friend to friend, parent to child, although it wasn't so much on the, the parental part. But some of what really started cooking in me came out of that, those two conversations. And I believe that Jesus looked at the man who had identified as a victim. I ain't got nobody. He'd laid in a mat so long that his impression was there. And Jesus said to him, when he gave the answer that was nothing more but an excuse, he said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. I, I, I believe, I don't know that if he, whether he had the ability to get up or not and hold himself steady, we know that he couldn't walk, okay? And he'd had it for 38 years. But Jesus' words, every one of them a commandment to action, rise. And I believe the word rise is about getting up out of a place of lying down and looking at the world this way. And Jesus says, rise. How many of you know the way y'all look right now is not the same way as you look now? The world is sideways when I'm flat of my back and I'm living in a victim mentality. But all of a sudden, things take on a whole different perspective when I rise, when I stand up, when I look at your neighbor and say, get up. We got to get up out of what's been holding us down. And sometimes it has more to do with how we've seen ourselves than the actual disease or the malady or the affliction that we're fighting. And so I believe he had to get a new perspective. And he got up, and all of a sudden what Jesus said happened in his life. And he said, you know, this is how it goes. God breaks through in one area, and all of a sudden that gives you faith to take the next step. Well, I got up out of my bed, and now what i got to do is take up my bed. Why would Jesus tell him, take up your bed? Because you know what? If you leave it there, you're tempted to go back and get in it. Oh, I wish somebody would help me in this place this morning. If you leave that set of circumstances that have limited you in your thinking and you let it stay set up, it's too easy to think, oh, well, this is a bad day. I'm just going to go take a rest back in who I used to be. Now it makes sense. Jesus is calling me to let go of who I was then and even who I am now so he can, I can become who he is making me. Come on, somebody. Yeah. 
get up out of your comfort zone. Comfort zone is not where anything great happens. It's going to require some stretching. It's going to require some leaning into something that has more power. And that's the word of the Lord. Put your hands together and give him praise. But not only did he have to get up and rise up and get a new perspective, he had to get a new position. That was one that he wasn't going to go back to what he was in. Take up your bed, fold up that 38 years worth of all of those old memories because that's not who you are now. That's who you used to be. And if you're going to walk, you've got to let that go. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, let it go. Finally, number three, rise, take up your bed, and walk. You got to drag that stuff and get rid of it. You got to drag it down to the garbage can, drag it to the junkyard because that bed stinks. It's a mess. Probably probably went through several sleeping mats over the years, but they all had his impression in them and he had to start taking one step, one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. Rise, take up your bed and walk. What am I saying to you? Those of you that are struggling with something this morning, Relationally, financially, you can't keep doing what you've been doing and expect the situation to change. You can't go into who you're called to be with the same mentality of who you used to be. Come on. I want you to hear this this morning as I bring this message to a close, and then we're going to receive 20 new members. Hallelujah. Jesus calls me to let go of who I was then and who I am now to become who he is making me. And in the middle of all of this, a man who gets victory, a man who gets a breakthrough, and the religious leaders are not worried about one thing. Why are you toting that bed around on a holy day? The scripture says, let me go back and look to it. He says, it's, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Verse 10, verse 11, he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. You know, Jesus, notice this. The church so many times are concerned about what's wrong in your life before you can get everything right. How many of you know Jesus will heal you before he even deals with your sin issue? Now, once you realize he's done something indescribably great and a miracle's taken place, that's when you need to know that, oh, God, I, I need you to live. I need you to walk. I need you to help me make right choices and good decisions. And Jesus didn't leave that eye undotted. He said, now, go and sin no more. Walk with me. Learn how to follow me, okay? The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now, I just, I'm closing this and I'm finished. But I want to say to you this morning, you are not called to be a victim. You're called to be a victor. And realize that all of life has deaths and burials and resurrections. You grow your children up and they walk across that stage at high school. And <clears throat> the fact that you've had them in your house has just died. They're about to leave and be sent out into the world. You see them accomplish something great in their life, whether it's extending their secondary or whether their higher education or maybe they started a business or they're in training or doing something like that and no longer are they on your payroll. Now, that's a death that you welcome, I'm going to tell you. The day that I got both my kids off my payroll and I had a couple of nickels to rub together, I was shouting golden streets, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you know, everything, everything that requires growth requires change. All change has some kind of death to it. If I change my mind, I have to let the old way of thinking die. And my whole life now in Christ is that I'm supposed to be sp paying attention to the identity of who I am now and not who I used to be. You can't live your life B.C. before Christ as a Christian and have any kind of victory. You need to learn and let your mind be renewed, let go of who you were then and even who you are now so that you can become who he is making you to be. Come on, somebody, put your hands together and give the Lord praise. Legalism is compassion disabled. 
God, help us when we're more concerned about how something gets done than the fact that it got done and somebody got a breakthrough and somebody got victory and somebody got well. Lord, help us. Help us as people. You know, it's amazing how we pray and ask God to bless a church. God, just send the people, change the delta, and then here come the people that need change. And they walk in the door and they don't look like you and they don't think like you. And they, you look around and they're in your seat. Oh, my God in heaven. What in this world are they doing? That's been my seat. You know what I wanted to do this morning? I wanted, to, I wanted after worship, I wanted to get up here and go, okay, every one of you, get out of your seat and go sit in a different section. But I figured I'd make a few people mad by doing that. And so I just said, no, I'm going to tell them what I was thinking about doing. And just my whole point would have been, don't get so comfortable in where you are, even in your thinking. Because real growth means change, and change means the death of something and the new life of something else. Come on, somebody. And so this morning, I close this message by asking you very simply, whatever you're struggling with, God has the certain man specifics on you, the certain woman details about what you're facing. And he's looking at me and he's looking at you this morning and he's saying, do you want to be made well? Do you want? Because sometimes we get so comfortable in our struggle that we've made friends with others who are in the same struggle and we like to identify ourselves by our struggle. Well, I am. And you know, one of the most dangerous things you can do is say I am and then fill in the blank behind it. Make sure that when you say I am, it's what the word says about you. I am a child of God. I am healed. I am whole. I am blessed to be a blessing. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am holy because he made me holy. I am blood bought because Jesus died for me. Come on, somebody. Instead of, instead of accepting what somebody told you at some turning point in your life, back in the past and you've let that be hung on your neck and you've identified with it I am Jesus is simply saying I want you to let go of who you were then and who you are now so I can make you who I've called you to become and the question is how we answer that do you want to be made well am I coming up with an excuse well this is how I've always been do you, but do you want to be made well that's the power of the gospel right there. That's the struggle that I'm still facing in knocking down this last 25 pounds. You know, at first 50 just like melted. Glory to God. Man, I was, put me on the cover of a magazine. Glory to God. Another 50, but I want to tell you, it's slow. Ooh, it's a process. And I've got my routine. I can work out and I have a good time. And it's mental therapy for me to work out. But you know where this last 25 is going to come from? Somebody said abs are not made in the gym. They're made in the kitchen. And that's where my problem is. See, let me tell you something right now. Folk think, you know, working out and exercising and being healthy, they think that's just so hard. That's the easiest hour of my day when I get in the gym and I do that because it's mental health. I enjoy it. I've, I've built some new friendships that are outside the church. Glory to God. Have friends with real people. Not that y'all aren't real, but you know what I'm saying? It didn't come out right, Glenda. Most of you are real people. You know what I mean. <laughs> You know what? That, that hour of the day is not hard. You know what? The hard thing for me, the other 16 hours when I'm not asleep, to keep from opening those refrigerator doors, that's what's hard. That's the death that I have to die for the abs to be made, for me to get in the kind of shape that I want to get in this latter part of my life because I have longevity in my family line, and I'm going to break 100 and still be in my right mind. Now somebody said, well, yeah, Jesus will be back before then. Well, he hadn't so far, so I'm going I'm, I'm to still plan. If he does, guess what? Then I'll get the glorified body a whole lot quicker. Glory to God. You know, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if he comes and he catches me up with him, he's taking me wherever he's going, wherever that is, I don't care because I just won't be with him. 
then guess what? Immediately, as soon as my eyes see his, I've immediately got that 32-inch waist. Glory to God. <laughs> How many of you hear what I'm talking about this morning? Everything that's wrong gets made right. It all gets fixed. Lord, I wish he would come right now. So many problems in the world would get fixed if he would just show up. Because you know what? He's not coming to take sides. He's coming to take over. Glory to God. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, help us as we bow our hearts in this place. Forgive us. Forgive me. Lord, when I've made excuses, when I've let an identification make me a victim, God, thank you that we are who you've called us to be. Help us to renew our understanding in that, to, to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Lord, I ask you right now in Jesus' name, if there's someone under the sound of my voice who has never said, Jesus, save me, never crossed the line of faith, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around, if you're ready to take that step to let the old die and a new life emerge, all it takes is just putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Slip your hand up. I want to pray for you this morning. Anybody in the room as I look around? Anyone? Anyone? All right. Now, those of you in the room that are walking with the Lord most of your lives, but yet you know that right now there's still something that you're struggling with that's not fixed. It may be a worry, a concern, a loved one, maybe any of those other things that I could list, financial, relational, marital, children, whatever, job, Whatever it is, whatever it is that you're struggling with and there's a pattern that you keep seeing the same thing happening over and over. God, God knows the specifics. He knows that you're a certain person and what you're facing. Slip your hand up right now and let me pray for you. Everybody in the room, that, that speaks to you right now, all over the room. Yes, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for everyone in this room right now who looks to you and we lean into you, Lord. And we just ask you, Father, show us how to rise the new perspective. Show us how to take up, Lord, the bed that we've been lying in in our comfort zone. And Lord, how to walk, how to walk this out with new progress, with newness of life. We're careful to thank you and give you the praise. It's in your name that we ask these things and all of God's people said, amen. We're going to stand this morning and sing our worship.